and gentle, and of course very modern apes, we need to talk about Homo boduensis. If you've been conscious on Paleo Twitter recently, you have probably seen Homo boduensis just about everywhere. This is a new paper that came out in Evolutionary Anthropology, which essentially came out and said, we know you guys like Homo heidelbergensis, we know you guys like Homo rhodesiensis, but we think that we should just scrap those guys and instead use Homo boduensis as a catch-all for many of the specimens that fell into either of those categories. What we're going to talk about today is whether or not they're right. <laughs> the answer, of course, is we don't know, but I'm eager to get into it, so let's do it. Now first it needs to be said right off the bat that Homo bodoensis is not a new hominin, right? It is not new. This is basically taking Heidelbergensis and Rhodesiensis and booting them and then taking some of those fossil specimens and putting them into this new species name. It's based off of the Bodo 1 skull and we'll get to that. But first I wanted you to see what the guy looks like and also appreciate that when you google bodoensis you get this, did you mean Homo rudolfensis? No I did not. Um, but, you know, I don't know, maybe we'll boot Rudolph and this too at this rate, holy moly. So this is Homo bodoensis, an artistic rendition. You can see right there. Can you see him right there? Let me double check. Yeah, you can see right there. Um, fairly human looking. This is an organism that is proposed to have lived, if you can see from this picture right here, which again, we're going to get more into this in a minute, uh, is proposed to have lived effectively from mm, point. 8 million years ago, so 800,000 years ago, to about 400,000 years ago. Uh, it is distinctly on the human lineage, according to these authors. Most of the authors are from China, um, which plays into some of what we'll go into later because they discuss some of the, the Asian specimens as well. This is specifically on the human lineage, uh, to the exclusion, of course, of Homo neanderthalensis and Denisovans, or Homo longi, which is another story entirely. Um, Homo bodonensis is also occurring after the most recent common ancestor between these three species here, Neanderthalensis, Denisovans, and Sapiens, as well as Bodoensis. Um, I might also accidentally say Bodonensis as well, so give me a little bit of slack there. But let's get into the paper, shall we, now that you've kind of seen uh, what this guy's proposed to have looked like. This is a pretty hot off the presses situation. Um, so we're just going to start at the beginning. <laughs> the paper is was released on uh, October the 28th, and it's titled Resolving the Muddle in the Middle, the Case for Homo Bodoensis, novel species, right? Now, oh, oof, we got to cover that too. What is the muddle in the middle? The muddle in the middle refers to, moving back to this graphic over here, the muddle in the middle refers to the fact that we just have an absolute insane number of fossil specimens from around this time period, right? 800,000 years ago to about a million years ago, give or take. And the reason it's called the muddle in the middle is because this is the time period when the most recent common ancestor of Homo neanderthalensis, Denisovans, and Homo sapiens lived. And as a result, both that most recent common ancestor and every recent offshoot is kind of this weird scramble of morphologic traits, right? Because they're starting to have some of the traits that would eventually define Homo sapiens, and some of them are starting to have the traits that would differentiate Homo neanderthalensis, and some of them still are having traits that would differentiate Denisovans or Homo longi to the exclusion of everyone else, right? Um, these eventual populations, of course, would go and yield these species, but at the time, they're really hard to differentiate from each other, and very likely, in fact, almost certainly, they could interbreed with one another, which further complicates the situation. So you might find an individual from this time period that looks very similar to, um, you know, has some of the traits from Homo neanderthalensis, right? 
It's not a Neanderthal, but it has some of the traits that would be Neanderthal defining, right? Not all of them, but some of them. You might find a species that has some, or a species of specimen that has some of the traits of Homo sapiens, right? It's not Homo sapiens, but it has some of the features that will eventually define Homo sapiens. And those two individuals could interbreed and maybe produce offspring that has some Neanderthal traits and some sapiens traits. You see what I mean here? This is the problem of genetics and hybridizability and all that good stuff. And unfortunately, a lot of these guys are too old to actually pull DNA from, so we don't know <laughs> the details of, of some of these uh, some of these one night stands that were occurring. And previously, this would just be another Homo heidelbergensis. Homo heidelbergensis, uh, as well as late Homo erectus and Homo rhodesiensis, are known to be members of the late Pleistocene or the muddle in the middle. Muddle being because we can't tell who's starting which lineage. It should also be noted, and we'll get to this in sort of the drawing section, that the more recent in time you get, the bigger this problem becomes because we have so much fossil representation in some ways and not enough in others, right? So we're getting fossils that are spaced out by 100,000 years instead of a million, two million, three million years, and so it's hard to tell, it's hard to tell where one species ends and another begins. Now remember, a species isn't defined by one single trait, typically. It's a suite of characteristics that define a species to the exclusion of others. It's never usually one thing, which is why you can have an organism that is, as in this picture over here, you can have something that's on this lineage here towards Homo neanderthalensis that maybe has the Neanderthal brow ridge, but none of the other Neanderthal traits. And you can basically look at that and say, okay, it's not a Neanderthal, but it's on the way to being a Neanderthal. Once it gets the rest of these traits, the specific mid-phase prognathism, the occipital bun, things like that, it, once it has all of those, then it will be a Neanderthal. There are, of course, issues with that too, because that implies directionality, which there is no directionality in evolution. We can see directional selection looking back in time, but this is only in retrospect when we have the Neanderthal skull, the Neanderthal postcrania, and we know what makes this organism different from all other hominins. Then we can look back in time and see these traits slowly emerging over time in response to different pressures, right? That's the name of the game here. Of course, it's important to note that geographic location and temporal period are also vital when it comes to understanding whether or not uh, a hominin is is on you know the Neanderthal lineage or perhaps the Homo sapiens lineage or even the Homo longyear denisovans lineage, right? Depending on where a hominin was found and when it was found, as well as the suite of characteristics that it possesses, we can decide with the pretty high degree of certainty where it's going to fall. And we know we can decide this with a pretty high degree of certainty because when we have access to the DNA, it tends to confirm what our initial morphologic, geologic, and temporal um, uh, predictions were. So the name of this paper, the, this, this uh, groundbreaking paper, is called Resolving the Muddle in the Middle, the Case for Homo bodonensis. Uh, sorry, bodoensis, a uh, novel species, Homo bodoensis. And um, in their abstract, they note that the introduction of new taxon Homo bodoensis in novel species as early as the middle of Pleistocene is going to be an ancestor of just Homo sapiens, as we previously talked about, with a pan-African distribution that extends into the Western Mediterranean as well as the Levant. They also note that many of the fossils in Western Europe should be assigned from Heidelbergensis to Neanderthalensis, and they're like, we're also not going to touch the China fossils because we think that those represent a different lineage altogether. So this is the abstract. The main text uh, digs a little bit deeper into this. You've got the introduction. They talk about what Homo heidelbergensis is, how it is single-handedly responsible for muddling the middle of the Pleistocene, uh, why hominin taxonomy matters, and then they talk about moving forward what their plan is. Now, before, before we touch on this very briefly, I think it's important to mention um, what Homo heidelbergensis is and discuss why it kind of is a little bit of a problematic taxon. Homo heidelbergensis is what we consider, and the creationists love this one, a, a wastebasket taxon, right? And the reason is because any of the guys who are found in this time period here, right, in this weird muddle in the middle time period, basically get chucked into Homo heidelbergensis. And they're like, this is Homo heidelbergensis because it's found during this time period and it has traits that cannot be definitively assigned into the Homo sapiens lineage, the Homo neanderthalensis lineage, or the Denisovans lineage. So this paper wants to solve that problem by severing it up, <clears throat> excuse me, and basically doing nothing with the, the heidelbergensis that eventually lead to neanderthalensis and Homo longi or longi Denisovans. Uh, also not touch the most recent common ancestor, 
but the ones, the Homo hadabergensis, that appear to lead down the sapiens line, they want to call Homo bodoensis. So are wastebasket taxons bad? No. In fact, they litter the fossil record, especially at these time periods of transition, right? But that being said, wastebasket taxons are meant to be placeholder spots, right? Until we can kind of figure out what it is that actually defines Homo heidelbergensis, how can we separate out the lineages into their, their Homo sapiens, Homo neanderthalensis, and Homo longi slash Denisovans um, um, trajectories, right? The same is true when we have them within dinosaurs, wastebasket taxons within dinosaurs, and there is another wastebasket taxon that is known in primate evolution, and that's the Omomyids, right? The Omomyid primates, these kind of early adapted, um, um, they're, they're like adapt, they're the other end of the adapted tree, right? Omomyids, Omomyids are eventually going to lend themselves to the haplorines, whereas the adapts are going to lend themselves to the strepsorines, right? We murder sources, stuff like that. Um, so wastebasket taxons are bad. The, the point of them is that they're placeholders, right? Other than Heidelbergensis, there really isn't um, a wastebasket taxon within hominin evolution. Lee Berger will sometimes point to early Homo, specifically Homo habilis, but there's a little bit of a potential conflict of interest there because he really wants um, Australopithecus sediba to be the base of Homo. So we're not really sure, but definitely Homo heidelbergensis. So... That's what the paper is going to resolve. And then it gets, decides, here's, here's the plot for moving forward, right? First, we're going to suppress Homo heidelbergensis, right? This is done through the um, International uh, Committee of Zoological Nomenclature or the guys who decide what gets what name, right? There is actually a committee that decides what binomial nomenclature a creature gets, right? Homo heidelbergensis. This, pro this proper nomenclature, that's up to the uh, ICZN. These guys are also in charge of what's eventually going to be the name for Denisovans, and it's it very well might be Homo longi. We'll see. So they think that they should, they formally want to appeal to the ICZN and say we need to suppress Homo heidelbergensis, which is just the ICZN uh, terminology for saying we're going to boot it. We're going to use something else instead. Um, and they back this up by saying it's very muddled as a taxon. We're not really sure what to do with it. There's nothing that's, you know, going to be specific to it morphologically or genetically. So why don't we just bop it out? Then they think we should do the same with Homo rudisiensis, which not very many people use Homo rudisiensis anyways, as it notes here, never gained a wide usage in paleoanthropology. Um, and it's got like this weird colonialist background to it. So they also want to get rid of it because of that. It's not really any skin off my nose for Homo rudisiensis. And then they propose Homo bodoensis, right? Now, this part of the paper is not that bad. They do propose a holotype, which is bodo1. A holotype is the same thing as the, the type specimen, right? It is the first specimen that you have that has the entire suite of diagnostic characteristics that can be used to differentiate this alleged new species from any other critter in the fossil record related to it, which of course is everything, but more closely and further away, right? So. Bodo 1 is the type specimen for the proposed Homo bodiziensis, bodiziensis, rhodiziensis, Homo bodoensis, right? Um, and then they give this really nice description, right? They discuss the things that Homo bodoensis has, um, faces strikingly massive, large rectangular orbits with a broad interorbital region, wide nasal root and aperture, deep, robust left zygomatic, and a broad, deep palate. Um, they discuss the nature that of the brow ridge that differentiates it from uh, Neanderthalensis and that entire line, which is that while it does have this heavy brow ridge, it's not a shelf, right? It's recessed in between the orbits. Uh, they discuss the uh, cranial capacity, which is 1250 uh, cc's. And um, what else do they, what else is important for this dude here? We have neurocranium preserves an almost complete frontal bone, and it basically discusses the state of the fossil, right? Then they discuss other, uh, I think this is actually a little bit down, but they discuss other hypodimes, so other mandibles, uh, faces, things like that, that can be considered a member of the same species as Bodo 1 or Homo bodoensis. Uh, discuss the age of it, species diagnosis. It's diagnosed by unique combination of cranial traits. The Bodo specimen has already been described as showing a mix of Homo erectus-like and Homo sapiens-like features. Um, the species is similar to Homo erectus in having robustly built midface, total facial prognathism, projecting tori and flattened low frontal squama, sagittal healing, a low vault profile, and prominent, pr uh, prominent parietal angular torus. Thick vault bones, so it's actually characteristic, um, you know, the characteristic of humans is having this thin cranial vault. 
Um, no foramen lacerum is observable, present as never narrow crevice, and these traits can be linked to the retention of the general cranial structure of Homo erectus. Then they note the kinds of things that, that kind of make it different from um, the likes of Homo uh, of neanderthalensis as well as what actually makes it different from Homo erectus, which is an increased cranial capacity um, and certain, certain, um, certain features on the parietal walls, things like that. Let's see, what else do they say? It has a number, it lacks a number of Homo sapiens specific features warranting a special species designation. So that's another thing. So they're like, it's different enough from Homo erectus and it's different enough from Homo neanderthalensis. And then people might be like, okay, well, why aren't you just calling it archaic sapiens? And the reason is because it lacks a lot of Homo sapiens specific features. Um, contrary to what is observed in Homo neanderthalensis where the autapomorphies emerge early in the Pleistocene. Ha however, all of the other Homo sapiens specific features can be derived from traits present in Homo bodoensis, including the massive but segmented brow ridge. So basically they're saying Homo bodoensis doesn't have the traits to the degree that we find in Homo sapiens, but the precursor structures are indeed there. Talk about the hypodimes again. Um, and then they move on to the discussion and the conclusions. So they go, here we present Homo bodoensis as it's this new species and suggests that it's ancestral just, you know, just to Homo sapiens. However, our new species should not be considered the most recent common ancestor of Eurasian Neanderthals and Denisovans and African Homo sapiens hominins. As schematically presented in figure one, Homo bodoensis separated from the Eurasian groups before the split of the Eurasian forms into Neanderthalensis, Denisovans, and possibly other groups. While essentially an African species, Homo bodoensis may have played a role in the evolutionary history of the Levant in Europe, in particular middle Pleistocene specimens from the two regions, mostly concentrated in the Eastern Mediterranean, which do not demonstrate any Neanderthal traits, such as the Mala, um, Balanissia in Serbia, and some specimens from the Levant, etc., etc. We did not include them in the hypodime at this stage because the fossils are too fragmentary. This newly defined species of Homo bodoensis, described on the basis of Bodo 1 specimen, has clear advantages. It recognizes the variability in geographic distribution of Middle Pleistocene hominins. It describes the unique morphology of the African Middle Pleistocene hominins as it, that as it extends into the Eastern Mediterranean and that is distinct from Homo neanderthalensis. And it predates the, the appearance, rather, of, um, of Homo sapiens. While not a two true species in the strict biological sense, since there is a strong and growing evidence of migrations as well as gene flow between these diverged groups, this newly defined taxon cuts through the obfuscation and inconsistent use of improperly named and defined middle Pleistocene hominins in Europe and Africa and should facilitate a more consistent and meaningful discussion around various topics presented here. So let me see, I wanted to say one more thing up here. Um, most recent common ancestry, yeah. So, Interestingly enough about this entire thing uh, is that the entire paleoanthropological community kind of freaked out a little bit, right? Homo heidelbergensis <clears throat> has been a, a sort of catch-all term for these early middle Pleistocene hominins for so long that to basically take a big chunk out of it and say, instead of Homo heidelbergensis, we're going to call these something different. We're going to call it Homo bodoensis. Um, and then everybody's kind of less saying, okay, well, what about all the other Homo heidelbergensis? And it's like, well, some of them are going into Neanderthalensis, and uh, I guess we'll get to the rest when we get to it, right? So um, instead of doing what they actually set out to do here, which is demystify and, and decomplicate this entire situation, um, a lot of the paleoanthropological community kind of feels like this was just like, okay, we're going to just add some new names, right? It doesn't actually change the, the fossil specimens, right? It just gives them a different name and separates them out in a different way. Why not just keep, keep things as Homo heidelbergensis until we can clearly delineate which populations went in which directions, Would is my personal opinion. Not to say the work that they did here is, is bad per se, I just don't personally agree with it. Um, John Hawks, who does a lot of work on this kind of thing, got a nice, uh, he's a paleoanthropologist himself. He mentions over here, that he would prefer, actually, that we just call all middle Pleistocene hominins like that have the brains of modern humans homo sapiens, right? And that he thinks that this is going to let us focus more on things like population size rather than like how the populations themselves have changed because of all this interbreeding rather than focusing on giving every single unique population its own species name. Um, to the contrary to that, though, um, there has been some pretty consistent backlash to this idea of giving all hominins names and and separating them out into these smaller groups 
especially because it's inconsistent with the rest of zoology. And Tattersall is kind of known, and John Schwartz are known for putting this idea out there, but they're like, look, we're being consistent with the rest of zoology. Neanderthals wouldn't just be a different species, they would be a different genus, right? It wouldn't be Homo neanderthalensis, it would be like Neanderthalensis sapiens or something like that, or, or encephalus or something like that. So these are a couple of the issues that we face here. Does this actually demystify the situation? I don't know. To me personally, it doesn't. Um, and you know, that the situation is complicated, right? It doesn't, you don't have to simplify something that's complicated. You just have to understand it, I think, and, and kind of lay it out. So let's summarize what we've learned from this and what we've talked about in a nice little handy dandy series of doodles. So to lay things out in very simplistic terms, before Homo bodoensis, we had a group of hominins that were referred to as Homo heidelbergensis, and they made up a kind of vague range of approximately this, right? Including representatives that would eventually become Homo neanderthalensis, Homo longi, and Homo sapiens. Basically, if it wasn't Homo erectus and it wasn't Homo neanderthalensis, Denisovans or Homo sapiens, it was going to be dubbed as Homo heidelbergensis. This paper came along and said, no, we're going to go ahead and not do that. And instead, we're going to take that range that you had as being Homo heidelbergensis, right, this kind of vague lineage, we're going to get rid of it, and we're going to say instead, this section of hominins is no longer Homo heidelbergensis, it's Homo bodoensis. And as for these other lineages that will eventually lead to Neanderthals and Denisovans, and these kind of ambiguous erectine-like early hominins, we're not really going to touch those. We're going to reassign some of Homo heidelbergensis and the rest we're, we're kind of going to leave semi-ambiguous. The problem with this is, of course, that it doesn't actually appear to demystify the situation, and instead it just renames a couple of the hominins from Homo heidelbergensis to Homo bodoensis in a way that, to the authors, appears to at least decomplicate the situation of, the, of our own lineage, right, from Homo sapiens and backwards to the uh, most recent common ancestor between these hominins here, Neanderthalensis, Lungi, and sapiens. And that might be partially true. We'll kind of see what happens. But the crux of the problem is, of course, the muddle in the middle. The guys that are going to go and become Homo sapiens, right, the guys that are going to become Homo neanderthalensis, and the guys that are going to become Denisovans, at this point in time, right here, are fairly indistinguishable from one another. Even here, they're fairly indistinguishable from one another. And at any given point, they're capable of interbreeding. And therein lies the issue. How we will resolve this issue? I am unsure. <laughs> This is the cool thing about human evolution, though, because even if we've got, you know, this glut of evidence that's kind of front-loaded for, for hominin evolution, but if we had only had, you know, an early Homo specimen over here, maybe Homo heidelbergensis, and maybe an erectine over here, Homo uh, erectus, and then maybe an archaic Homo sapiens over here, and then maybe a Neanderthal over here, right? we would still see this slow change over time, right? And we might connect the dots in an incorrect way, but what we would still certainly see is this gradient of change from something that's more basal to something that is more derived. And this is the problem when you've got too many fossils, because at this point, you know, you've got one, you've got one lurking over in this area over here, right? Um, got another hanging out along the Denisovans line. And you've got another hanging out maybe at the end of Neanderthalensis, which is more derived than basal. And now how do you connect the dots? You realize there's multiple lineages. And this is how human evolution truly has changed over time, right? So with more and more finds, we've been able to revise this tree until we've basically said, well, we've got too much to work with. <laughs> we've got a couple of early homo, a ton of erectus, some late erectus, some antecessors, some neanderthals, some denisovans, some sapiens here and there. Um, and it's this whole section that is homo heidelbergensis that is causing us so much trouble. If you want my idea of the solution to the problem, and keep in mind I am but a humble PhD student, I would suggest keeping Homo heidelbergensis as this group of organisms that is defined 
um, by the most recent common ancestor and everything on the line to Homo neanderthalensis, Denisovans, and Homo sapiens. So these critters here, here, and here. And instead of cutting them up into different species along these lines, unless we could clearly delineate them, which I, I don't think we can, I think in the meantime what we do is we come up with regionally specific lineages, right? So we've got, you know, African Homo sapiens that eventually comes from some kind of guy up here, and African Homo sapiens will eventually become all Homo sapiens, right? Um, or rather, African Heidelbergensis that eventually will become all branches of Homo sapiens within Africa, and then they spread out. Maybe you've got your European Heidelbergensis that is eventually going to become Neanderthalensis, right? And uh, similarly with Denisovans, you've got your uh, Asian Heidelbergensis that eventually comes along the Denisovans line, Homo longi line. This is pretty much what they're doing now. Um, my proposal is just the current version, but maybe do it better. But that's also what happens when you get someone who's not specifically focused on late genus homo um, trying to talk about it. I'm sure the folks in charge will figure it out. I'm sure they know what they're doing. So is Homo bodoensis a valid taxon? Should this new species name replace the members of Homo heidelbergensis that eventually lead to the Homo sapiens line? Um, I don't know. I am of the opinion that perhaps it shouldn't. We, we need to put a pin in it until we kind of flesh it out a little bit more. But we'll see. What do you think? Do you think that we should replace Homo heidelbergensis with Homo bodoensis in the case of its sapiens lineage and put a pin in the rest of it? Or do you think things should stay like they are? Or do you have a different idea of how things should work? Let me know in the comments. And until next time, my gentle and of course very modern apes, stay safe out there.